Hey, thank you, uh, youth worship team. It's excellent to have them uh, to lead us and to, to have a, a different perspective. I, I said in the first service, our worship team just got younger, you know. But Hey, on the screen, Galatians chapter 2. We want to go back there for a second. You recall we've been looking at the book of Galatians, and we deviated from Galatians for three weeks. And the reason we did that, you'll recall that Galatians kept talking about the law. Do you remember how many times the law occurs in the book of Galatians? 33 times. It's the law, the law, the law, the law. And what he's really trying to say in the book of Galatians is, look, you are free from the law. The, the Spirit of the Lord set you free. You'll know the truth. The truth shall set you free. But they kept coming back to the law and kept coming back to the law. So I said, let's do this. Let's look at the law. For a second. Let's look at then when we did three weeks, just kind of looking at the law and how it could impact our lives today. Now let's go back for a, a moment back into Galatians and say, okay, how does that affect us? Especially how did it affect that church? On the screen I have this question: Can others see the difference Christ makes in you? I would hope that they can see the difference Christ makes in you, but uh, I'm not sure. You, can your neighbors, would they look at you and say, oh, you know, I, I don't know they whether they're a Christian or not, but they sure live like one. Did they see that difference in you? Uh, for me, as a pastor, I don't wear a, a placard and says, you know, I, I are a clergy, you know, and, and everybody run away from me. I We don't do that. We, but do they look at us and say, hmm, I, there's really something that's different about them. You know what was interesting? In the last service, young man sat right here. After the service, he said, I'm here because in high school, one of your people was my teacher. And she was really godly. I, I don't know. I haven't seen her in a while, so I don't know. Her name is Diane McNett. And I said, oh, she was just over here in the last service. Uh, and he said, you know, she just, she was a Christian and she lived like it. And there were times that people would get after her. But she was a great teacher and a Christian. And I'm here today because she was there. Isn't that amazing that that, that would happen? Now, can others see the difference Christ makes in you? Or let me just flip it around here for a second and say it this way. Can you tell the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian simply by observing their lifestyles? Are you, are you seeing that in other people? You say, oh, they're a Christian. Or can I really, sometimes, some people are going, yep, I can tell they're a Christian or not by their lifestyle. And there are some times that you can't tell because people can be good without God. You know, they, they can treat other people kindly. They can give. They can love. They can do those things. They, they don't have to be really foolish people. But the question here is, can you tell the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian simply by their outside lifestyle? And I would say, no. You can't really tell by their outside lifestyle. Because outward appearance doesn't mean that they're a believer or not. There are people that go to church, and they're not believers. Uh, there are a lot of people sitting in church in America today that are going to spend eternity in hell. And I'm sad to say that. I mean, I'd love that everybody that was in church well, were going to heaven. But just because they're in church doesn't mean they're saved. There are people that go to church that have never trusted Christ. They just were taught, oh, this, I think I need to go to church. Let me put this picture this way. This is a little silhouette of a man. I have embedded into that man Colossians 127. Colossians 127 says this, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles, non-Jewish people. See, Jewish people knew all about God because God had made a covenant with them. But what about the non-Jewish people? And so God wanted to make known among everybody Jews and Gentiles, by the way, if you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile, according to the, the scripture. 
you, you were outside this covenant with God. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of his mystery, which is, what's, what's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, the difference between you and somebody else is whether Christ is in you or not. Can I tell by their outward behavior they're a believer? Well, sometimes you have some indicators. But those indicators can be there. People can pray. Doesn't mean they're a Christian. People can go to church. Doesn't mean they're a Christian. People have even gotten baptized. Doesn't mean they're a Christian. People take communion. Doesn't mean they're a Christian. People can do a lot of things. And it doesn't mean they're a believer. On this, let me say it this way, it's who's in you that makes the difference. Not what is outside here, this outside behavior that you're observing. They sing hymns, they do kind of things, they help the poor, but that doesn't mean that Christ is in them. What you're looking for is Christ in you, the hope of glory. By the way, can I just really be clear on this? It does it say Christ in you plus this and this and this and this? Is it anything besides Christ in this text? Christ in you. If Christ is in you, you have the hope of glory. Now, what was happening in the church at Galatia when we were, we were going through this book? At the church at Galatia, people had trusted Christ as their Savior. They were wonderfully, ah, oh, they, they thought, oh, this is great. And then some Jewish people, because Galatia, by the way, is up in what is Turkey today, north of uh, the Mediterranean. So here in this area of Turkey, you have the churches of Galatia. And in those churches, they had heard the gospel, and they thought, oh, this is good. But then some Jewish people came who had said, oh, this, this is good, but you need more. And so Paul writes to them, and he says, you know, this happened in my church in Antioch as well. Now, so now you got three churches I could be talking about here. The church at Jerusalem, the church at Antioch, which is about 300 miles just right north of Jerusalem, and then the churches of Galatia, which are now in what we call Turkey. Paul said, you know, Galatia, well, I had this experience in my home church in Antioch. And what happened? Well, here's what happened. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Oh my goodness, can you see this happening? Here is the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter going face to face. But when Cephas, the Aramaic name for Peter, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. And then he says, here's what happened. For Peter regularly ate with the Gentiles before, to get that operative word there, he used to do this before something else happened. Peter came, man, Peter's a Jewish man. Peter's high-fiving, glad-handing, having dinner with Gentiles, something a Jewish person is not permitted to do. Oh, unless Peter became a believer and they're a believer, now you ought to have fellowship. But Peter regularly ate with these Gentiles before certain men came from James, who was the leader of the Jerusalem church. However, when these men came, what did Peter do? Withdrew and did what? Separated himself. Two things. By the way, the Greek word here for withdrew is actually a military term for that he made a retreat. He got back. And I don't mean a retreat like, hey, let's have a ladies' retreat. Let's have a men's retreat. Let's get together and have all the food and have all that fellowship, and we'll have just a retreat together. I'm talking about a retreat. You're on a full-out battle, and all of a sudden, they start to retreat, and he pulls back. That's the picture here. Peter withdrew, made a retreat. Oh, and he did a second thing. He separated himself. And here's the problem. Here is Peter. When he preached the gospel in Acts 2, how many people got saved? 3,000. 
when he preached again in Acts chapter 4 and he preached the gospel, how many people got saved? 5,000. Now, he's going to this church in Antioch where these people were trusting Christ and he's having great fellowship with them. But all of a sudden, some of his friends from Jerusalem show up and they say, hey, wait a minute. You're supposed to do this and you're supposed to keep the law and you're supposed to do this and... And they wanted to add stuff in order for people to be saved. And here's what happened in the church. People were saying that Peter was acting just like everybody else. They couldn't see any difference between him and an unbeliever. Because how do unbelievers act at times? Well, they're, they can be all over the map at times because they have no absolute biblical authority over their lives. And what Peter do? Well, Peter would eat with them, and then he withdrew from them. And Peter was friends with them, and, well, which is it, Peter? Do you understand what was going on here? And, and so in this case, well, let me drop this in. The next verse, then the rest of the Jews, the ones that came from Jerusalem that showed up and he pulled back, the rest of the Jews joined uh, his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas, the son of encouragement, even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Look, let me say it this way. If we claim to be believers, we should live differently from those of the world. But what was Peter doing? He was living like the people of the world. He was collapsing under this pressure. Why do we often stop doing things. You know, we want to take a stand for the Lord, and then some peer pressure comes along, and what do we do? We just collapse. We're afraid what people are going to say about us. And what happened in Peter's case here? I'm talking about the guy that preached the gospel. And thousands of people came to the Lord. But what happened here? When his friends came along, he just collapsed. I'm talking about the guy that some people think that started the, was the first pope. I'm just saying to you, look, I don't want to build a church on this kind of behavior. You want to build on the word, and you want to build on the rock. And who's the rock? On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all that the ground is, sinking sand. So if we're going to claim to be believers, we should live differently than those in the world. I want you to look at, there are a lot of ways that we ought to be different. Not odd, not weird, not obnoxious, but different than the world. And in this passage, I'm going to give you three ways that the word indicates that we should live and be different than the world. Okay? First one is this. We must walk correctly when it comes to God. You know, you ought to walk your what? How to walk your talk. If you, if you talk this way, you ought to walk this way, right? But this isn't talking about that per se. This is talking about the gospel. You ought to walk correctly. When you're telling people how to be saved, it ought to be correct. You ought to cut it straight. It ought to be just right. Here's what the text says. Verse 14, Galatians 2. Now, Galatians 2, 11 and 12, I just read to you how, remember, how Peter didn't do what he's supposed to do. By the time you get to verse 14, but when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone. I got right after Cephas in front of everyone. You say, wait a minute, isn't that a little harsh? Look, this is what God says to do with leaders in sin. Leaders in sin. My brothers, be not many masters, knowing that you shall receive the greater what? Condemnation. So if you're a pastor, if you're an elder, if you're a leader in sin, you get confronted. And he says, do it publicly so that it warns other people. Now, when it comes to other people, you go to them just one-on-one. -on -one. If they don't repent and refuse to listen, then take two people. If they don't repent and refuse to listen, then you tell it to the church. But you know something? We never, we never talk about any specific sin that they do. We say we've gone to them. First, said, we're, we're not sure this appears to be sin. You're living with another man's wife. What are you doing? Or whatever is going on. And then if they refuse to listen, they say, we don't care. 
we just go back with a couple of people and say, listen, we really want to win your heart. How do you want us to treat you? As a, as a brother? As, as a believer? Or as an unbeliever? Because if it says a believer and you're living in open sin and you refuse to listen, we should have nothing to do with you. If you're an unbeliever and you say you're an unbeliever and you're living in sin, you're living like an unbeliever. And our goal should be to do what? Win you to Christ. So how do you want us to treat you? But they were deviating from the truth here. And so let me just drop this in and say it this way. The Greek word for deviating is orthopedeo. Now, just, you know, especially if you're, if you're visiting with us, let me just say it this way. Old Testament was written in Hebrew. New Testament was written in Greek. And so there are times we'll dig out those old words so that you can say, hey, here's what it means and here's why it means and here's what we need to do to live like that. So orthopedeo is they were deviating from the truth. Orthopedeo can be broken into two parts, so let me just slide it up here on the screen so you see it this way. Ortho, when it's a word by itself, it has a sigma on the end. Orthos. When we put it with another word, we drop the S so you can say it and, and speak the word. You don't say orthos padeo, you say orthopedeo. So orthos means straight. We use it in a ton of ways in our society. I mean, the, the English language didn't all of a sudden just come out of, uh, out of nowhere. So a lot of the words come from the Latin and the Greek. And ortho means straight, and we use it in this word, orthodontist. What's an orthodontist do? Straightens your teeth, hopefully, without breaking your jaw. But sometimes, I, you know, they, but they have to do a lot to make it straight. Is it easy to make it straight, your teeth? No, it's hard, and people, you know, it's cutting up the inside of their lip, and they're putting wax on it, and they're going, they go through a year of struggle so that they can have what? Straight teeth, and maybe longer than that. In the same sense, it is not easy to make God's word so straight and so clear that the gospel doesn't get deviated from. Do you understand that? Let me give you another word that we use it with, uh, orthopedic. If you go to an orthopedic surgeon, what does that surgeon do? That surgeon says, ah, I need to straighten out this mess that you've gotten into. Let me give you an example of that. Um, about, uh, about seven years ago, I, I was skiing, and uh, we were on the, the Black Diamonds over here uh, on the, the hill. And we were on a great day, but uh, I got uh, a just clipped uh, by a snowboard, and I just went. And all of a sudden, you know, I put my, usually you're supposed to kind of sit back and bend your knees, and so if you're going to fall, you fall backwards. But when I hit the board, it made me go forward. And what do you do when you go forward? You're going to land on your face, so what do you do? You put your arms out there, and when I put my arms out there, man, I, when I, when I, uh, I never went, I never blacked out, but when I kind of came to, even though I wasn't out, I go, oh my goodness, my, my skis are over here, my poles are over here, my right arm is over there, my, you, know, you know, I felt like I'd gone all over the hill. And I, I said, oh, wow, that really rung my bell, I said. And so I, I got up and I said, no, let me get my skis back on and we'll, you know, I'll ski the rest of the, go down the rest of the hill. So I'm getting stuff ready there. And I have to reach up to, you know, put my goggles back in place. And when I reached up, all of a sudden, pain just shot completely through my arm and right up. And I go, oh, my goodness, what on earth is going on? And I don't know why, but I, I just reached right in here. And I went, oh, no, I broke my collarbone. Now, I'd never had that happen before. I never knew it was, you know, but, boy, just that instant, I knew, hey, here's the problem. And it was, it was like... I had a, it's like I uh, had a, uh, a pacemaker put in, you know, with this big old bump here because the, the bone had just kind of shattered. And, you know, I, when you're in your 60s, it does things like that, you know. So I, you know, it was just kind of shattered there. And I, I said, well, I'll, I'll ski down the hill. And they said, oh, no, you're not. And so they had the sled and they took it. And then I, I go to a, 
an orthopedic surgeon. You know what the orthopedic surgeon said? Ah, oh, I got some good news and some bad news. He'd, he'd take in the x-ray. He said, I got some good news and some bad news. The bad news is you've broken your collarbone. No, duh. <laughs> you know, I'm in pain and I, can't, I don't want to move my arm and I'm kind of like this. And he's, he says, the good news is it'll heal on its own. Don't worry about it. And I said, and how long is that going to be? He said, oh, you know, six weeks, it'll be all, you know, but you can't, you know, don't move it around and just, you know, I'll put you on a brace. And I said, okay. So I got six weeks of this stuff. Huh? I'm going to get up here and preach and, and be in the sling. And I called, Joel Bong and got a hold of me. Uh, he was in, he used to be one of our elders here, and he'd been in Mammoth for a while. He was in, in Missouri, I think, but. He gave me a call and he said, hey, you need to go to the doctors in Mammoth. Because you're not going to, you know what happens in Mammoth, right? I mean, they just ski a lot. And what, when people ski a lot, what happens? They get broken bones. And, and, oh, they not only ski, but in the summertime when they don't ski on that hill, what do they use? Mountain bikes. And they go down the hill with the mountain bikes. And when they hit the bump the wrong way and, and they go flying over the handlebars. They put their arms out, and what do they break? You need to go to the doctor in, in Mammoth. So I go to the doctor in Mammoth, and here's what happened. They did the surgery. I was in the surgery. They put a plate in. What's the orthopedic surgeon's job? To make things what? Straight. To straighten out the mess you got into. And so he put a plate right here, six screws or so, six or seven screws. When I came out of that surgery, we're on our way home. I can lift my arm in the air. I couldn't move my arm before. <clears throat> couldn't move my arm before. I could raise my arm up. I could put my arm back here. I could put my arm here. What's their job? Did, did it hurt, you know? Yeah, but once he did that, it was corrected, then it could heal right. Listen, when it comes to the gospel, and here's what happens in Galatians. He said, look, Paul gave it to you just right. Paul's writing here. He said, I, I told you, this is how you get saved. It's by grace alone, in faith alone, in Christ alone. But now you're deviating. You're getting Where? You're getting off the path. So straight, orthos means straight. Padeo comes from this word, pus, pus. And the word pus is foot or feet. See the word padeo? We use it all the time in an English word for that as well. Padeo is a podiatrist, a, a foot, a foot doctor. And so let me put the two together, and this is what it means. Make sure your feet are walking straight when it comes to what? The gospel. But he said, you've deviated from that. That's not where you are. And so Paul uses his experience with the church in Antioch to show how one falls off, out of step with the, with the truth of the gospel. He said, Peter did this. And Peter said, oh, yeah, maybe we need to have, you need to be circumcised. You trusted Christ, but to be a part of the covenant, oh, you need to be doing this. Really? Not. And why am I telling you this? Why do you need to understand this? It's because today in our society, you can be taught to trust Christ as your Savior. But then groups come along. I'll give you a couple of groups. Uh, Mormons come along and say, oh, but, it, you know, it's not just that. You need to do this and this in addition to that. Or the Jehovah's Witness come along and say, oh, you need to do the works of Jehovah. And God in his word constantly says, it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Not by, not by works, lest any man should boast. So Paul says, Peter, what are you doing? you're telling people that why are you changing this this wonderful plan you're deviating from the truth let me illustrate it this way let's say it's like a, a balance beam 
on a balance beam. You've seen them in Olympics and people doing these flips and these unbelievable things. See that bar, that beam? That's only 10 centimeters. That's only four inches. Four inches. You either land right or you're hurting. And you flop off there. Let me say it this way to you. When it comes to the gospel, you either stay with the gospel or you're going to be hurting. It's either Christ alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. If you start adding to that, then you negate all that Christ did on the cross. Christ said on the cross, it is finished. It's been done. Nothing you can do gets you saved. You have to trust him and him alone. Otherwise, you, you fall off the beam. Let me illustrate it even this way with the beam. If you, if you look at me for a second, if I had a balance beam here, and, and I were going to walk that balance beam and, and try to do it really well, and believe me, I'd fall off at no time. You ever, you ever walked across a little river and the log is right there, and you think, uh, hey, let's just walk across that, and the next thing you know, two or three people are where? In the, in the drink, you know, in the water, in the brink of the water. So, but if you're on that balance beam, are the people on the balance beam, while they're focusing on what they're doing, are they going, hey, mom, doing pretty cool, huh? You know, are they focusing? Where are they focusing? Look, let me say it this way. Keep focused. Forget about the what? The audience. What did Peter do when he showed up. He was high five and fellowshipping, having dinner with these Gentiles. But when his friends, when the audience showed up, what did he do? He pulled back. Had nothing to do with them. He wouldn't cut it straight anymore. Jesus said it this way in, in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life. And how many find it? Few find it. That's why we want to keep proclaiming it to other people. That's why we send missionaries. That's why we believe that God's word says that Christ is the only way to heaven. It's Jesus who said that, not me. That's why when we go to a Buddhist country we we don't we still talk about the gospel it's jesus we don't say that they're one way and ours is one way jesus said his way is the only way and that's why we send missionaries and that's why we tell people about jesus let me illustrate it this way let's pretend this is the road this path that we're to walk on and it's the gospel and the gospel is first corinthians 15 Verses 3 and 4. How Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again. And what does Paul say? That if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, confess with your mouth, you know, and that you believe that he's risen from the dead, you'll be what? Saved. He said, that is, that's the gospel. But here's what happened in Galatia. They started out well on this path. Look at the screen. And then... They deviated from the path. And I don't care whether you add things. You can add nothing that gets you saved. Jesus paid it all. What can wash away my sins? What's the songwriter say? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you. He sang right there with me. You know, you know? Well, I can wash away my sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So why should I add anything else? Whether it's baptism or communion or circumcision? Yeah, that's what they had a problem with because they were, they were Jewish people in the covenant. Or keeping the Ten Commandments? Is there anything that I can do? Christ paid it all. That's why he said, it's finished. Now, once I'm saved, I ought to be obedient. And obedience says, repent and be baptized. Obedience says, hey, 
As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Take communion. Learn uh, and be reminded of what he's done. But communion doesn't save you, and baptism doesn't save you. What Jesus did on the cross saves you. And once Christ comes into your life, see, I, let's, take, let's take the baptismal water right here. If it were right here, and, and we baptized, like there, there were three that were baptized last week. But if they aren't saved when they go in that water, they're not going to be, if Jesus isn't in their lives when they go in that water, Jesus isn't going to be in their lives when they come out of that water. He says, look, if baptism could save me, Jesus would have never come and died on the cross. I could just get in the water and be baptized. So they got off. They didn't walk how? Straight when it came to the gospel. Cut it straight. Don't get this wrong. It could affect your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids. Paul said, look, when he wrote the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, he said this, I'm amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. You were walking this way, and yet you turned away to, to another gospel. Oh, by the way, he says it this way, which really isn't another gospel. Because there's only one gospel. How Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again. And if you don't trust that, heaven's not yours. He said, you've turned to another gospel. You are not walking straight when it comes to the gospel. The gospel is one thing, how Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again. Not communion in addition to that, or baptism and communion and other things in addition to that. The gospel. And that's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. What gets people saved? The gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation, not that plus something. How appropriate it is on this, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. This is the closest Sunday to the 500th anniversary of that, that the just shall live by faith. They place their faith in Christ. That's what saves them. The just shall live by faith. But Paul had to say in Galatians 2.5, Galatians 1, 6, he said, you're turning away. Galatians 2, 5, he said, but we did not give up. And we did not submit to these people, even for a moment. I didn't give up so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. Because you get this wrong, and you spend eternity away from him. Look, if you claim to be a believer, you should live like you're a believer so that people could see that. What are the ways the word indicates we should live? Oh, we should walk correctly. This is how you get saved. Don't add to it. Don't make people think they could work their way. All the other religions in the world add to the gospel. You have to do something to get saved. Christianity is the only one that says, it's been done for you. Walk correctly. We must live consistently. What do you mean? Here's what the text says. When Peter did what he did, he ate with them before. When they showed up, he didn't eat with them. I told Peter, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you, who are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like a Jew? Let me highlight it here. If you, a Jew, live like a Gentile, so let me just say for a moment, let me pretend I'm Peter and I'm Jewish. And if I'm Jewish and if you, a Jew, say, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to live like a Gentile. I'll come over here and live like a Gentile. If you, a Jew, live like a Gentile, how can you compel the Gentiles to get over here and start being circumcised to get saved and live like a Jew? What are you thinking? Peter, you're inconsistent here. What's going on? You're telling them this way and this way, and you're having fellowship with the Gentiles now, and you're not having fellowship later? What's going on? You're inconsistent in your life. We need to live how? Consistently in our walk. 
But this isn't the first time Peter's been down this rodeo. Why are people inconsistent? What makes you inconsistent? What makes it so that you stand up for the Lord now and then over here, ah, uh, you back away a little bit. Oh, at church you're really in love with Jesus and oh, at work you, you don't want to offend somebody. What makes that? Peer pressure. This is the fourth time Peter's had that happen to him. Let me show you the first three. You're familiar with them. It's in Matthew chapter 26. Let me start at verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. What was going on? Jesus was on his way to be crucified. Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl approached him and said, You were with Jesus, the Galilean, too. But he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. Ah, and the first time, what's he do? Gives in to peer pressure. Ah, I don't know what you're talking about. Verse 71, when he had gone out into the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were there, this man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again, he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. Ah, the second time, peer pressure collapses in. Verse 73, after a little while, while those standing there approached and said to Peter, you really are one of them, since even your accent gives you away. Then he started to curse and swear with an oath, I don't know the man. Three times, peer pressure collapsing. And what happens in Galatia? Another time. What happens when the Jewish people show up? All of a sudden, he's not hanging out with them anymore. Those Gentile people, nothing to do with them. He collapses. Now, before you get all judgmental about Peter, let me ask you if you've been consistent in your stand for Christ. Or if you don't collapse at times. Look, if you're claiming to be a believer, you should live differently than those in the world. And the ways the word gives us happen to be eight one. You walk correctly. Cut it straight. Secondly, uh, live consistently. Don't flip-flop back and forth. Will you ever uh, have ups and downs? Yes. Are you perfect? No. If we say we do not sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't in us. You want the truth to be in you. Let me give you the third one. We must trust Christ completely. In the Galatian church, they start to say, well, maybe, maybe we're not saved. After all, do we, they told us we had to do this, and they told us that this had to be part of it. And Paul was coming along and saying, look. Now, hey, can, can I get you to look up here a second? Look at here. This is the hardest sermon to preach. You want to know why? Because every one of you, if you've been in church any amount of time, have heard this a gazillion times. And I heard that before. When somebody starts to tell you a story you heard before, what do you do? I heard this before. Oh, yeah. We, had, we used to have a guy years ago in the church here, and he would keep telling the same stories again and again and again and again. And his wife... After a while, she, she was behind him, and he started into another story, and you know what you know what his wife did? You know, he's sitting here facing us, telling the story. She rolls her eyes, oh, no, not this again. How many times am I going to hear this story again? I want you to be cautious that that's not where you are when it comes to the gospel. This is how you got saved. I would want you to say, wow, this is, you know, I, I, I know, I know this story, but this is how people get saved. This is how people go to heaven. This is how people get changed lives. And so instead of just saying, oh, well, like water off a duck's back, you go, wow, at least I know this church is going to continue to play, proclaim the gospel of Christ. It's by grace alone, faith alone in Christ alone. 
And when somebody comes here, you want them to hear that. And the day we stop proclaiming that is the day we might as well close the doors. Even though you've heard it before. Why is it the hardest sermon to preach? Because you've heard it before. And you can kind of turn it off if you're not cautious. Instead of saying, wow, let's cut it straight. And let's do it consistently. Let's proclaim this consistently. And uh, let's trust Christ completely. What do I mean by that? Verse 15, 16 of Galatians 2. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that no one is justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Can I... Can I just be where I've highlighted it by faith in Christ? Let's go back. No, verse 16, know that no one is justified by what? Can I just leave it at works? Any works? I mean, the works of the law ought to be better than any works you can do. Wouldn't they be? I mean, who gave us the law? God gave us the law? So is the law pretty good? Is that, are the Ten Commandments pretty good? So the works of the law, if you keep the works of the law, they probably are better than any works that you're going to do here. And he's already said, no one is justified by the works of the law, which ought to be higher than your works. So why would you think that any work that you do is going to get you saved? Your work can't save you. And listen to me, since your work can't save you, your work can't keep you. So it's by faith in Christ. No one is justified by the works of the law. What did justified mean? We said it means kind of two things. Just as if I'd never sinned. No one has ever looked at, and God never proclaims and declares no sin unless you do it by faith. No one is justified. Justified means just as if I'd never sinned and just as if I'd always obeyed. No one is ever justified by the works of the law, but you are justified by faith. And God looks at you and says, just as if you'd never sinned and just as if you'd always obeyed by faith. He goes on. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified. How? By faith and not by the works of the law. How many times do we have to say it? The law can't save you. Keeping, working, doing doesn't save you. So if you're here today and you don't know you're going to heaven, Nothing you can do is going to earn that. Why not just accept what Christ did on the cross so that he died for our sins? So that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and he's risen from the dead, you will be saved. But it doesn't stop there. Let me take it further. Let me go back and hammer this point home. Romans 3.20 for no one will be justified, declared right before God, in God's sight by the works of the law. Because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. So you want to know why God gave us the law? So you'd know what sin is. What does the law give you? Salvation? I can't hear you. No. The knowledge of sin comes through the law. That's what it is. He said, knowledge doesn't get you saved. But you have to know you're a sinner before you think you need a Savior. This is Romans 3.20. Romans 3.28, here's what he says. For we conclude that a person is justified, how? By faith, apart from the works of the law. Can I just keep beating this drum? Let me give you one more. Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous, that's the word for justified now, we have been declared righteous, how? By faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You are not his enemy anymore. You are at peace with him. He's at peace with you because you're saved. You have peace with God. Here's how I started out our time together today. I said, here's a silhouette. The silhouette, how can you tell if someone's a believer? Something outside their life or something inside their life? There's only one person. 
there's only one person that knows you are saved. <laughs> well, besides the Lord, there's only one person that knows you're saved. That's you. Only you know whether you've done it. I don't know. I see evidence. I hear evidence. I hear you confess. I see you get baptized. I, I'm thrilled. But only you and you alone know that you've done this. You want to proclaim it to others? That's great. You want to live it out? That's great. But only you know that you have the real deal. Only you know whether you have asked Christ in you and you've trusted him. Christ in you, the hope of glory, and that's what I said. It's who's in you that makes the difference. Ah, but we're in Galatians chapter 2. And you need to cut the gospel straight, right? And that's verse 14. And you need to walk consistently. That's verse 14. And you need to live this out in a, in a way that trusts Christ and Christ alone, verses 15 and 16. But in Galatians 2, verse 19, and the verse 20, here's what he says. It's who is in you that makes the difference. Galatians 2, 19. For through the law, I have died to the law. What? How did that, how's that possible? Here's how it's possible. Through the law, the law condemns me. The law says I deserve to, to do what? The wages of sin is death. So the law condemned me, and I was condemned to death. But I have identified with Christ, and I have been crucified with Christ. So I was condemned, and I went to the cross. With him. He died for me. Through the law, I have died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives where? You see, it's the in you that makes the difference. It's not the outside stuff here. The outside stuff is simply a way where you confess before others where you get baptized, where you take communion, where you go to church, where you have fellowship, where you do pray. But it's what's in here that's going to make the difference, whether you have the real thing or not. And today, as you're here, I want you to be able to say, ah, it's Christ and Christ alone in your life. The question I have for you is, can others see Christ in you? And the difference that Christ makes in you. But if Christ isn't in you, Christ isn't in you if you haven't asked him to come and live in you. This is what you have to do. Christ does everything else. The response you have is what you do in faith to confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Have you done that? Let's pray today. Oh, Father, thank you for your word that's so strong and so powerful and that we have the wonderful privilege of proclaiming it so that people can come to know you as their Savior today. While your heads are bowed, while your eyes are closed, If you need to pray today to trust Christ as your Savior, perhaps something like this would be the words that you would pray for Jesus. I'm a sinner, and I thank you that you died for my sin. And I'm praying now that you would come and live in my life. That you'd be my Savior, my Lord. And that I'd have the joy here on out of knowing that you said you'd never leave me and you'd never forsake me. Come and live in my life today. And I might glorify you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you trusted Christ as your Savior today, we'd love to talk to you. Encourage your heart. 
we'd be thrilled because by praying that prayer today, you've just joined an, another family, the family of God, that for, forever family that will spend eternity together. <laughs>